All right. Well, welcome, David. Thank you so much for, for coming this evening. Um, as most folks know, we've been doing a series of um, videos. We've, we've talked about the neuroexperiential model of brain spotting. We've done an overview of that. We've also talked about frame. And tonight, um, David is joining me to discuss setups and focus mindfulness. And so I will leave it to you, David, to start from there. Okay, uh, this is like our own little podcast, Shuri. You know? Yeah, yeah. A brain spotting podcast. So um, it's interesting that uh, what is called the setups, I called it that way for a very specific strategic reason mm -hmm. uh, early on uh, to distinguish how we set things up with the client uh, from protocols. Okay, the language of brain spotting aims to be clear, clean, and descriptive. Um, and so I called it the setup because this would this is how at you know for most of brain spotting before the neuroexperiential model, you know, we I developed it and we've trained, you know, around the world, uh, people in the how to set up a frame. Okay, so the setup of the frame okay, distinguished from a protocol and other modalities, um, was that you'd start with whatever the issue is, you know, with the client. And, and remember, issue is completely open. Whatever the client brings, they don't have to define it in terms of anything that fits our model, okay? It's whatever it is for the client, which is the reception model. So, um, issue can be something that a client can't even verbalize. You know, they can't even mm -hmm. articulate. Uh, it could be an emotion, it could be a, a body sensation, or it could be just something that they know isn't right. There's no issue of having to um, uh, go to any memories, any trauma memories. There's no issue of going with imagery or all of these things. All of that is can be can be highly relevant, but that's not what we're looking for with this. We're looking for, in the context of uncertainty, to invite the client and receive from the client whatever it is that brings them into our office. Okay. Which now in the neuroexperiential model we call the, the frame that they that has developed that they bring with us. But pre-neuroexperiential model. We called it the setup because they bring their issue. The setup, it was step by step, although it doesn't have to go step by step. It's just a, an organized way of us looking how we, there would set up the frame. Now I call it receive and shape the frame. But uh, so uh, it would go from the issue to really activation. And activation was and is a, meant to be a very open generic term. And activation is whatever the client determines it to be. Um, but it, it means that there is systemic or neuroexperiential activation for the client. Um, what if a client says, well, there is no activation? Of course, then we encourage them to go inside and try to activate themselves. Well, what if they can't activate themselves? In most models, most emotional or body-based models, you couldn't work with the person if they're not activated. But in brain spotting, because it's, it is a client-centered, client-supportive, uh, receptive model, um, we know that it took a lot for this client to get to come in to see us, whether it's for the first session or the fifth or the 15th session. We know that to get started is a big challenge, and we also know that to continue is a challenge. There's, it's not resistance from a, a psychodynamic point of view, but, but there's... People have, would rather not open up. People would, would rather not have to sit with another person and talk about what bothers them, you know, uh, and face whatever comes up. So even if a person can't get activated, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. okay? it, it, and, and there are many brain spotting therapists who haven't fully understood this. So I'm glad I'm having a chance to say this now. Um, it's whatever, if the client, cannot be aware of or communicate activation. It's whatever brings them in for therapy with us, mm -hmm. whatever brings them in for that particular day. 
Okay. Um, and well, how can you, if without activation, then where do they feel it in their body? How, you can't even ask for in their body. In brain spotting, it's, it's uh, don't worry, be happy. You know? <laughs> um, uh, is it, you know, I, I guess if a person isn't aware of being activated, the question of where do you feel it the most might, you know, an inside window might seem to be irrelevant or unusable. But of course, brain spotting is a no assumptions model. And a client who can't identify activation or body activation and so on still might have a sense of where they feel it the most. So you could try out inside window. Mm -hmm. you, you know, again, this is uncertainty. This is uncertainty in all aspects of, of the process. But of course, even without the client being able to be aware of activation, just thinking about why they're there, what brings them there, what causes them to continue, mm -hmm. you can always look for reflexes mm -hmm. and they'll always present themselves. And because reflexes go down to a, uh, a brain stem to spinal level, you're getting deeply uh, below what is neuro experientially uh, accessible to the client. So this can be a very good way of doing it. But of course, the, uh, the insurance policy we always, always have is gay spotting. So again, if the person says they're not activated, you just have them talk and talk about whatever it is, whatever brings them there, whatever's going on, and you watch for those, you know, um, you know, classic uh, eye gazes with, you know, even a fuller head and neck or even body uh, orientation to it. And so from there you have that. So in that case, the setup process goes from, you know, uh, issue without activation, without body, straight into finding the eye position. Now, because we have been so programmed into believing that you have to do things right and you have to do things step by step. And if you don't do it this way, it's not going to work as well or it's not going to work at all. Okay. It's really important to, to, to know that we are liberated in brain spotting from all of those things. Okay. That it is the client in their nervous system, everything that, that determines their nervous system and everything that rises up in their nervous system that we're working with. And it's always present. And if a person doesn't say, can't say, well, where they feel in their body, their nervous system is feeling it all over the body. Their nervous system is well aware. So getting that access that down to the autonomic nervous system and, and down to the spine, spine and the peripheral nervous system gives us what we need. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, um, it, it's just a, you know, the access is there. So the expectation that we, do a setup a certain way and we get this information, forget about it. That's why it's not really even a setup because, because we may use all or some or little or even no aspects of it. Let's say a client can't even articulate an issue, okay? Why they're there. And you know, for some clients uh, who are just very conceptual or some who are dissociate, uh, dissociated or some who are nonverbal. So, of course, then you can't can't do it. But that's not true. You can do it. Okay. Let the client talk about whatever they want to talk about and watch what their eyes feel. Mm -hmm. And once you see where they orient to enough, primary spot, secondary spot, just guide them to look at it and process from there. And even if consciously they're not able to participate for a while or even a whole session. They're still, you know, they're still there. They're still activated, you know, and their activation brings them there and the processing goes from there. Mm -hmm. Okay. But again, I, I, uh, I digressed. Okay. I digressed away from just the issue of activation. Most clients are activated and, and are able to identify. Why would we then ask a client who says, well, I'm not really that activated? Say, well, how much zero to, zero to 10, one or two? Why would we ask them to try to activate it or, or push it up? Not because they have to, but because their system may begin to show itself more mm -hmm. if they push up their activation. By the way, there are some clients who get so 
uh, easily activated or uh, hyperactivated or flooded that you might not want them to push up the activation. Mm -hmm. So it's very individual and very diagnostic. Mm -hmm. But for the client where that's not the case, and, and it doesn't matter if it's a one or a two, you can work with a one or a two. Some other models say you can't work with someone who's not activated enough because of X, Y, and Z reasons that are truly not scientific facts. Okay, because we know we can work with people who, with low activation. Because the system is there and the system is complex and the system is, is dynamic. The system is never static. You can count on that. This, again, takes a tremendous amount of pressure off of us. But just going ahead with how it usually goes, you know, uh, if a client says a three or a four or a five, would I ask them to activate themselves more? It really is depends on who the client is, where they are, where they're at in the process. And it's also intuitive, just what my gut tells me. My gut tells me this is fine. Or my gut tells me, you know what? I think there's more. I think we need to push it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then you go from there and you know what? Whatever's going to happen is probably going to happen anyhow. And if for some reason you made a mistake by not pushing it or by pushing it, then it becomes apparent and it's part of the process and you work from there. Okay. So, um, and of course, because brain spotting is a somatic therapy, body-based therapy, we look immediately for where you feel the activation in your body, which may sound pretty simple and straightforward, but it, it, it isn't necessarily the case. You know? um, some clients will be very direct about it. And we'll just say, oh, I feel it in my chest. Boom, and we go from there. Some clients will say, well, I feel it in my chest. And they start like rambling a little bit. And you, you want to feel like jumping in and cutting them off, which of course you don't want to do unless there's a compelling reason to do it. And, you know, and it takes a while for them to unravel just where they feel it in their body. Some it's moving in their body. Some, you know, and, and some will, uh, you know, describe it in ways that are surprising. Expected this. I've had people say it's over here. Do this long enough, you're gonna you're gonna get that. Mm -hmm. So that's gonna say it. And might that mean it's in their energy field? And that would be quite possible, but you know, who knows? But in in that context, whatever they say it is is what it is. Mm -hmm. And then from there, it's the it's the activation that is present in the body that generally speaking, unless it doesn't work that way, we uh, then go for the eye position, okay? Um, so, so we're looking for the activation of the body to sort of guide the client and guide us to find the eye position, it, especially in, in inside window, which is a very serv serviceable way of finding an eye position, okay? Suds is a six, feeling it in your shoulders. Okay, where do you feel that activation in your shoulders the most? Where do you feel the most access to it? More to your left, obviously you take more time, more in the middle, more to your right. And then you go from there. Um, uh, and then of course you go on the Y axis. Some, of course, even if, when you do inside window, it's not always so simple and so straight ahead. And if it doesn't go the way you expect, it's not only okay, it's good. When things go in ways that you can't predict and control and understand, it's an uncertainty and you follow the client. Mm -hmm. It's always an opportunity. And sometimes you learn something from doing this. Mm -hmm. okay. And again, from if you're doing outside window, you know, the system is activated and, and, um, and there tends to bring, we believe that there's more focused activation in the system when the person is aware of where they're holding in their body. So in that context, you know, looking for reflexes outside window as you go across, you'll, you know, it is our hypothesis. It's a, no factual proof of this, but it, it makes sense, at least. Those eye position, you know, the reflexes that, that kick off we believe are coming from that the field of activation that is held 
with some awareness in the body. Okay. And again, with, uh, with gay spotting, usually before you even ask the client, where do you feel in your body? The client has already, you know, uh, uh, shown us some gay spots. You know? mm -hmm. Sometimes the client sits down and they go right on the gay spot right from the beginning before you even, in the first session, before you even mention brain spotting. But let's say, let's say either you haven't seen any, any notable gay spots or you have, but you want to see what happens coming out of the body activation. Where do you feel, uh, you know, it's, it's a six. Where do you feel in your body? I feel it in my shoulders. Okay. Just be aware of the feeling that feeling in your shoulders. It can be like pressing a button. You ask them to be aware of it, you know, you can easily get uh, um, eye movement, head movement up, up in a certain direction. And it may be the exact same spot that they have been, gay spot that they've been going to before, but quite frequently it's a completely different one. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, which one is better? And of course the answer is we don't know. If you want to ask a client which one they want to use or which one they feel like using, you can always, you know, you can ask them. And some clients know and some clients, clients don't know and it's fine either way. You can just say, okay, choose one of the two, or you can choose for the client, you know? And if somehow this one that got pushed by, by that body activation button isn't the one that they need to ride the whole time, they may float back over it to that other one at some point, or even more than likely go on to another gay spot. I have found usually that on gay spots, clients don't stay in the same gay spot the whole session through. Mm -hmm. You know, it happens, it happens frequently, but I find at least as frequently, if not more, the client will wander off to another one. I call it like a, a bumblebee looking for another flower for the nectar that they can get, you know, so that they can make the honey. Um, so, but swing this all around, okay, the term setup has taken on a life of its own in the brain spotting world. I was going to ask you about this. Yeah. Uh, not by my intention. Okay. Uh, because the way I look at it, and I know it's way past the point where I can even influence the language that people use. And I assume that people use this language that I, I've created most of the language in brain spotting, but that um, uh, if language comes up on its own, you know, not not by me or even against what I'm saying, it's organic as well. Okay. My viewpoint is the setup is only to serve the frame. The setup is the setup that leads to the frame. So the question that people ask, what's the setup for, is technically incorrect, but common language supersedes what's technically correct because it's what's the frame for. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if you use inside window, it's an inside window frame. You know, it's not an inside window setup. Or if you're using a more advanced sort of thing, double spotting, okay, and double gay spotting as I teach in, uh, in phase three, it's a double gay spotting frame. Um, if you're using the crocodile setup, you know, from Robbie Abel's. Well, it's a crocodile setup. It's a crocodile setup frame. She calls it the, the crocodile setup. So then, so that's that's her language, and, and she mm -hmm. accepts that language. Um, but it, but it goes all off in all these directions. But um, I did a lot of real contemplation uh, in developing the neuro experiential model, starting with not even reala realizing that I was contemplating it. Yeah. Um, I have sort of, my creativity is sort of restless. So I, I can't just create something and then I sort of sit with that. I create it and then sort of a restlessness inside of me that uh, is just wants to create more, want to, wants to explore more. So this was developing in me the, the, the sense of the neuro experiential model before I was aware of it. Um, but then once I started to become aware of it, like pieces of it 
sort of came to me. And I also would present it in my um, uh, monthly study group. And also I talked with other colleagues, including yourself. Um, so it started to become collaborative. But one of the key things that, uh, this is concept, okay? This isn't fact. One of the key concepts that I've developed in the neuroexperiential model is that is that the frame develops in the client long before they come to our office. So that we really don't set up the frame with them. Okay. It's a little bit um, egotistical on, on our part, on my part, to think, well, we can actually set up the frame. Because we can't do anything with the client that doesn't come from the client. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that the frame, the frame starts with the we're human beings. We have a frame as a self. We have frames as aspects of ourselves. And the and when we are unhappy or when we are suffering or when we can't do what we want to do and we feel blocked, we usually hold that frame ourselves and sort of figure it out, you know, trial and error or talk to other people and things like that. But when you can't get out of your own way or when you can't feel the way you want to feel, you can't stop suffering from anxiety or depression or other throw-offs from trauma. Okay. And you realize that you need help with it. That is a formation of a frame. Okay. And it's a frame that doesn't come up with the solution, but it, it frames the problem. And it frames the idea that I need to reach out to get help with this. And in this, in this context, uh, when the client comes in, they're carrying their frame, and it's our job to recognize it and to receive their frame or frames. You know, a frame has different aspects. There's frames within frames, but I'll just say, for simplification's sake, to receive the client's frame and hold it. But we do more than just hold. If we just receive it and hold it, that's a tremendous amount. So they're not alone. There's mm -hmm. someone who's listening, someone who, who is interested, who is concerned, uh, who has compassion for them, and someone who's there to help them with this frame to be able to experience things in such a way that that change comes to them. But, but what we do instead of setting up the frame beyond receiving the frame is we shape it. I'm talking in very literal language and it makes it almost kind of linear and it's not linear at all. But, but we shape this frame with, with the client and uh, by the setup process, what do you want to work on? They tell us, they bring it in and they tell us, they start to articulate. And as they're talking, we're listening, it starts to, to form. Mm -hmm. Form in, 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 in a different way because you know, we're holding it together. And then whatever questions we ask also kind of shape the frame. Ultimately, we determine um, what the person's level is in terms of being able to handle activation. And it's a diagnostic issue and it's from the beginning and it goes all the way th through the treatment. But um, uh, uh, we determine whether the client needs more of a holding frame we call it a tighter frame. I would prefer to call it a holding frame, or whether they need a more uh, spacious or expansive frame, whether they need more room. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's part of the shaping of, of of the frame. But but also keep in mind, and this is something that's not in the trainings. You, you probably heard me say it. It's not only the process that's inside of the frame, but is the process of the frame itself. I call it the process frame. The process frame, that frame that we receive, hold, shape, and so on, is always changing. And the process inside of the frame is also causing the, the, the frame to change, whether it's shape or size or configuration or three-dimensional. You know, the frame actually is more than three-dimensional. It's multi-dimensional, highly conceptual, so that the frame is always changing. But we're holding that frame together. The whole thing about this frame is that it's supposed to create 
a reconfiguration of their neuroexperiential self in relation to what, what they're struggling with, suffering with, or blocked with. So that the processing that goes on because of this frame, we say inside of the frame, it's not technically inside the frame. That's just part of the literal way of looking at it. Because the, the frame doesn't, in the neurobiology, doesn't create a container. It creates an experience, complex experience. And that's something about this two people together, old school therapy, we call it the bipersonal field. Mm -hmm. And this mutually held, you know, dynamic frame creates something in their neuro ex neurobiology and their neuro experience that is different than, than it would be without it, than it was without it. Mm -hmm. And so what happens with this? The person, we encourage the client to observe their internal process. We encourage them to observe mindfully where the things go. But it's not the kind of mindfulness. I mean, it's a derivative of it. It's a focused version of it. It's not the mindfulness that we do when we meditate by ourselves. It's, it's two people together and it's a lot more dynamic. And, and, and the person not only is in their focused mindfulness process, but they're experiencing us following them, okay? Which, which gives another dynamic to that mm -hmm. processing inside of the frame or because of the frame. And, and, and they know that we're focused on this, but we're focused on them and their process. And it's, and it's not just, and it's our subcortical somatic selves as well as our more conscious aware neocortical self that is following their process. And the client may be in a dialogue with us all the way through, or the client may sit there for 10 minutes or 30 minutes and not say anything. But eventually they say something. In 10 seconds, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, eventually they say something. And when they say whatever they say to us, we then realize not everything about where they went, because this is just a moment in time, but we realize where they are now. We realize that this um, neuro-experiential focused mindfulness process and processing has taken them to where they are. And we know that they wouldn't have gotten there otherwise, because this is like a chemistry experiment. You put two chem chemicals together, you're not going to get the same as if two chemicals were isolated, or that one chemical was isolated. That there's been a a change in their process, which is a reflection of the change of their of their neurobiological activity, that has somehow taken them to this place. Because we believe that the human system uh, is always looking to move towards regulation. Okay, that's our belief. That's it's based on fact it's based on neurobiology but but again everything every therapy is is hypothetical you know there's almost no facts in any and every therapy even though they're presented as facts brain spotting we not only are open about this we embrace this because it's part of uncertainty mm -hmm. so the client talks after 10 seconds 10 minutes 30 minutes and they tell us where, where they're at that's the first direct clue we have as to what happened and it's just a very narrow pinhole into that experience. You know? But it gives us a sense of where they are and they're telling us and we're receiving it. And oftentimes we just say, okay, keep going. Mm -hmm. Keep going, see where that takes you, you know, and so on. And, and that becomes the, the process. I liken this to, and, and by the way, humans are processing all the time, 24 hours a day. So it's not like they come in and they do a session and then they do processing and they leave and there's some post-processing. Our nervous system is always in movement. Energy is flowing through our nervous system. It's flowing through us. And we're so influenced by others in our, our environment as well. But I liken this to the dif difference between a wide river that's flowing very quietly and gently that comes to a narrowing and the water starts to rush and it starts to move and it starts to become a lot more dynamic. 
if you, anybody who's done, you know, whitewater rafting or kayaking, you know, has had this experience. But here we're taking that wider flow, that more open general flow, and we are taking it and we're making it much more intense. The focused activation, you know, theoretically creates this focused mindfulness. So it's like, so the processing that goes on inside of the framework or in response to the frame is really like, is, is, uh, it's like a river that now has come very narrow and the water is really rushing through it. Much more active, powerful, dynamic. And that's what the client, when they come out after 10 seconds, 10 minutes, or 30 minutes and says to us, mm -hmm. oh, I was, I was, I've been all over the place and I just sort of was thinking about something from the past and then I made a connection and here's the connection. Okay. That we believe that, that, that powerful stream of the fluid flowing stream inside of the frame or is response to the frame okay, is happening through the influence of the frame and is taking them where they're, where they're going and that they're observing a neuro experiential process and we're sitting with them as they are in it and observing it and occasionally reporting it to us. And ultimately, what do we say to them as we're getting towards the end of the session? We don't know, we can say anything because there's only guidelines and, and ideas. Frequently, as we get towards the end of the session, we look to bring them back to the beginning of their process. We're not going to bring, we're not actually bringing them to the beginning of the process. What we're doing is we're having them reactivate to go back to, to think, to think about in this moment now, after 30, 45 minutes, 60 minutes of processing, to bring it up now and to see what it looks like, what it feels like, how, how it's experienced by the person. And when they do that, first of all, sometimes you guide a person to do that and they bring up something completely different. Maybe the original thing has just shifted so much that this is where they're at. Or maybe they're just, you know, intuitively giving us whatever they're giving us. But we're looking to see what this rushing stream that happened the response to this mutually held, mutually shaped frame, dynamic frame. We're looking to see where they're at now, subjectively experiential and it doesn't matter what it is okay we're always you know we're trained to look for positive outcomes that we what we believe positive outcomes to be you know and that's because you know we're kind of what those of us who are western not everybody who's going to listen to this is western you know we tend to you know, try to get results from what we do mm -hmm. push the button and you want the candy bar to come down and you want it to be something that makes you feel like you've done a good job, like you're confident. We can be liberated of that. We can trust the client in their process. And wherever they're at is where they're at. And whatever has happened in this session is some level of healing, you know, which is undefined. You know? So we're just looking to see the results. You know, and it's even that is a little too focused and tangible of this process so that we have a gauge on it and the client has a gauge on it. And then we can sort of reflect together on that. Okay. And of course, as we say all the time, <clears throat> that we're not looking for the change to happen during the session because of this, because it's only 45 minutes or 50 minutes or an hour or 90 minutes. We're looking to create ongoing processing change after the session and between the two sessions so that when they come back to the follow-up session, whether it's in a day, a week, two weeks, or a month, even if we don't ask them about what we worked on the previous session, we're still mindful of where they have been since they left and where, where they are now. Okay. And the person will come back and maybe directly reference whatever we worked on or whatever led them to work on that, or they might be in a completely different place. Whatever it is, it's in the same 
neuro neuro experiential frame of, mm -hmm. of their self and and we can know that we can always rest on that so it's not like well we have to get back and check on it. it's like well where are they at it's always good to be mindful of like what they worked on the last time to see if there's any resonance that comes up mm -hmm. but but there's no have tos again we're looking to support the system to heal in a way that it wasn't able to heal enough for them to feel the way they wanted to feel or to be able to act the way they wanted to act or to be able to perceive themselves in the way they want to perceive themselves or perceive the world in the way they want to perceive themselves so that's a that's that's where i'm at right this moment catch me tomorrow i'll, I'll tell you a different story yes that happens okay i've got a couple of questions for you uh, that's what we're here for. Okay. Well, first of all, I just want to highlight what you said, because I've never heard you say it before. And maybe it's just because, you know, maybe I wasn't paying attention or I don't know. No, what. I probably never said it. Before, so. But when you said receive and shape the frame, um, I really like that because the, the, it leads into a question in terms of you know folks that are out there on the facebook group or in the trainings or they leave the trainings or whatever they're asking the question like what setup do i do for this issue and and really it, i would like for you to speak to that because my my thinking and i i'm open to correcting my thinking or or speaking to it is that it's not really about the setup that you're you're using with that client. It's about being with that client. And like you said, receiving the frame, whatever they're bringing in and what happens in that moment between you and the client as you're tuning to that client, mm -hmm. what they might need in that moment. Yeah. Well, what the, the, quest, the question, what is the setup for is a matching question. Mm -hmm. And for all my experimentation with brain spawning, I have found you can't match things. Okay. You can have technical wisdom by which you will receive certain things and under, un, re, understand certain things that you receive. But, but in fact, um, uh, there's, it conceptually uh, looks like or sounds like matching. Mm -hmm. Now, if you take Robbie Abel's crocodile setup and all her work with addictions. Okay. Um, it's not an attempt to match. It's an attempt to understand and work with systems that for um, a variety of reasons uh, are, are prone to uh, uh, addictions in different ways. Mm -hmm. okay. It's really, it's really the crocodile frames as opposed to a crocodile setup. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope, Robbie, if you listen to this, you take this as, as, uh, uh, as support and affirmation. Um, we could have a great dialogue about this at some point. But it's not matching. It's not looking to match because every person who struggles with addiction is unique mm -hmm. and struggles as there are commonalities. And these commonalities mm -hmm. help us to, to not just be total generalists. Uh, we have people who are experts in brain spotting in many different ways. But, um, uh, again, if the question is, what are the frames for? You know, at least it's moving away from, like you can, like you can make it happen, or you mm -hmm. can match it. Um, so, as we evolve, it would be, I hope that we get more to a point of, of how do you receive and hold the frame with people, who have or this particular kind of issue. You know, what are some, of, and, and it would be more, what are some of the perspectives? What are some of the nuances as opposed to the step-by-step, -step, you know, fix it, match it kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I was just, as you were talking, I was just thinking of my son who's on the, on the spectrum and the way that, the way I hold that for him at this point, he's looking for his own, brain spotter is very different. And, and maybe it's because I'm his mom, but he doesn't, 
the the traditional way of holding the frame just absolutely does not work for him. Um, that's because there is no traditional way to hold the frame. Because whatever he brings in, and it's and, and if he's on the spectrum, that's an aspect of what he's bringing in. Right. But it's who he is within his own life experience. Right. Which entails all kinds of different things that needs to be received and held and shaped with him. And, and the client co-participates in the shaping. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. it's not for us, well, in our infinite wisdom to know how to shape it. It's, it's for us to be in a dynamic, you know, um, um, uh, co-participatory process by which that happens throughout the session and, and from session to session. Uh, but there is, you know, there is wisdom. In, uh, uh, it, it goes more to the expertise that exists in our field around different client populations. I hate even using using that term, but um, uh, it's it's more like uh, uh, you know, if you have expertise in working with people on the spectrum, if you have people working with with addictions, obviously working with children or, or adolescents, you know, it's it's all of these different. Uh, different things mm -hmm. so um uh you know working with clients who have dissociative identity survival adaptation patterns instead of calling it a disorder mm -hmm. that's you know and again brain spotting is not here to reinvent re reinvent the wheel if if uh it, it, the expertise that's out there is for people to, to, this is when we talk about integration with brain spotting, you know, it's still in the context of uncertainty, still in the context of frame and tail of the comet and so on, and the neuro experiential, you know, model. Mm -hmm. um, okay. The other thing I just wanted to bounce off of you here is as you were talking about the stream, what I was hearing in my head was some of Dan Siegel's vocabulary in that how energy and information flow through a system and that what we're tr trying to do or attempting to do is to find the optimal way of holding or shaping with the client the frame so that the energy and information flows through their system optimally. Is that another way of saying what you were saying, David? Yeah, I wouldn't say it that way, because because that makes it seem too simplified. It's oh. it, it's just too mysterious, you know, to yeah. say the information flows through a system. You know, it it's quantum. Yes. Okay, um, and uh, to our minds, it's unknowable. Okay, mm -hmm. so. This is why you know we you know we fall back on on metaphors and things that are literal to describe something that is completely non-literal, you know, and and uh, uh, almost unexplainable. Uh, again, we're we're learning things about our universe, and we're learning things about you know subatomic uh, particles and forces. You know, and and to do it, you know, they have super colliders and you know, and and and, and all of this stuff. Um, there was so much more that we don't know than than we do know, and probably will always be that way. So it's just my kind of my reaction to this, and this is where in brain spotting we start with and we go with, and we always come back to uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And that that leads me to my my next. Um comment really in that you continue and you've done this since day one since i've met you continue to repeat to me over and over again these different um hypotheses uh thoughts always challenging um and helping me be aware of the conditioning under which i have gone and how I think. And, and so um, I just wanted to highlight that because even I, I watch, even after we do training after, I mean, and I've been doing this, I mean, you've been doing it a lot longer than I have. 
there's still this conditioning inside of us that will rear its head at certain times. And we have to be reminded to go back into to uncertainty. Um, and you've said, I'm not probably not gonna say it the right way, but you've said how this part of our brain really likes certainty and likes to go. Well, especially as Westerners. Yeah. Because we haven't grown up in the East or in non-Western places, you know, uh, I, I, I'm sure it's different you know, for people in, uh, growing up in those parts of the world and those communities. Um, uh, so how much of this exists for non-Westerners would you know, be a, a good question, but as Westerners, you know, it's, uh, it happens because you make it happen. And if you don't go out there and make it happen, it's not gonna happen, mm -hmm. you know? And mm -hmm. that's uh, very, a very limited perspective, right? especially, especially in this cosmos. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I know, um, did you want to say more about focused mindfulness? Uh, you know, we're going to come back and we're going to do that. We're going to do another one. Do it separate. Okay. Oh yeah. 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 I mean, I kind of talked about it through processing. A little bit. Yeah. But, but, but I do want to, you know, this, this is more looking at the frame, you know, and, and, and the frame, how it, uh, creates focused mindfulness, but, but yeah, I'd like to, uh, really do a neuro experiential deep dive into, uh, into focus mindfulness. Into mindfulness. Okay. Sounds good. Um, one last thing is about, can you speak to, and maybe you did a little bit when you talked um, about not having activation um, when the client comes in, but would you consider, can you speak a little bit to the numb? Like when people come in and they're saying, I'm just kind of numb. Why should we have a bias about that? Right. Why shouldn't we have curiosity about that? Why shouldn't we just accept and embrace it for what it is? Mm -hmm. You know, yes, it tends to go along with uh, hypo arousal, you know, which we have some understanding of, but it's still kind of limited, whether it's in terms of, of dissociation or depression or uh, contraction. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not usually a term that's use we don't use that so much in the field of psychotherapy but uh, again brain spawning is based on contraction and expansion um why should we look at anybody differently because they say they feel numb we should be curious about that person curious about what they mean when they say that what the context for that numbness that they feel and are, are describing are within themselves what's the history to that but it's really who who's the person, you know. Mm -hmm. um, if you if you really embrace the uncertainty, frame, uh, focus mindfulness process, you know, uh, model, um, then you work with whatever whoever brings whatever they bring in. You work with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Should you be concerned? Mm -hmm. Well, they're going to come out of hypo arousal and spike into hyper arousal. No, you shouldn't be concerned about that. You should be mindful that that's a possibility, but you don't want that on your mind so that you're prejudiced against and biased mm -hmm. against mm -hmm. who the client is, what they're carrying, where it comes from, and where they're going to go, because you never know. Mm -hmm. that's, that's very true. You never know. Surprises every day in the, yeah. in the office. I'll, I'll just sort of finish with this, is that, is that our field is rife with bias. And mm -hmm. bias is, an, is another opposite of uncertainty. Bias is a form of certainty. Which and is going to kick us right out of attunement, too. It, it will make Im, Im, attunement impossible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So um, uh, I always say look for the certainty in your model. I should be saying look for the bias in your model. Mm hmm and look for the bias and brain spot. You know, I not only invite people to do it, it's not a challenge, it's, it's a request, you know? Because um, brain spotting has, you know, is, it will always be evolving, but it has 
a lot of the basic tenets of it are, are open to be uh, to be challenged in a way that can help us to get better at what we understand and better at what we do. But um, uh, psychology is a uh, strives to be a science, and it undoes itself all the time with its biases. That's why we have a neuro experiential model that, that doesn't attempt to be a psychological model, although it doesn't you know, disengage or, or reject the psychological model. It's just a different way of looking at the human system and how to, how to understand it, how to be with it, and, and how to support it. All right. Well, with that, I think that's a good place to end for tonight. Yes. All right. And I appreciate you coming and having these great, uh, great discussions so we can put these out for folks to, to watch. And it sounds like our next one's going to be focused mindfulness. Yeah. Maybe we'll have another one after that. It's... All right. Sounds good. Okay. Anyhow, thank you, Cherie. You, uh, you bring out the best of me. Well, thank you, David. Okay.